Well, hello and welcome. Uh, this is Rob Lively. I will serve as the moderator for today's uh, afternoon session, the Poster Fair One, Immigration, Culture Wars, and Human Rights. The, I especially want to thank John and the association office, Alicia, and a special thanks to the program committee for helping to put together such a great program. Also a special thanks to Munir. In the last session, uh, at one point the moderator said, Munir, are you here? And he said, I'm always here. And so he is the one that's holding together <laughs> this whole thing in the background. This is the first of three poster fairs. If we were live, we would, these, would be act, these would be actual posters that we could go up and touch and look at. But of course, it's a digital event. And so these are electronic posters. We're looking at immigration, culture wars, and human rights. There are five wonderful presentations. We have Fashion Advocacy for Human Rights by Ms. Ellen Anders. We have Advocacy, Supporting Equity, a Global Context for Dr. Nadia Delaney. We have Researching Disinformation and its Implications for Democracy in the Global South, the Case of Mexico, from Dr. Garcia Galarzaria Molina. Next, we have Missing in Brooks County from Miss Lisa Molamot. And then finally, Fulbright's Legacy Caught in Cultural Wars on Campus with Dr. Margaret Scranton. So welcome to all of you, and we'll turn it over to Elaine. I'm sorry, we'll turn it over to Ellen. I can't quite read what I'm saying here. So Ellen, you're, you're, you're up. You're on mute. You're on mute, Ellen. That should do it. I should do it. There you go. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, I don't know if you can. Um, that's not what I'm seeing. Um, oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> let me go back to share screen. This should be it. Um, that's it. Let me, yeah, just let me make sure that it's in the right spot. Sorry, right, Ellen. Okay. Can you, yeah. Sorry, I'm Ellen, on. could you, could you share your screen one more time? I apologize. I... Okay. Let me see. I don't, um, yeah. Um, well, it's telling me to save. Well, okay. I'm not sure how to do it. Because, oh, there it is. I see it now. Should be a green button at the bottom. Uh, yeah, I have it right here. Okay, is that it? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay, let me see if I can, wait just a second. Let me see if I can fix this better so you can see it. Okay, I can't see the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know how to, we've got the pictures over on the right. Okay, um, anyway, I'll start with my program. Uh, I'm Ellen Anders from San Jose, California. And um, I see a problem right now. I can't show my, uh, oh shoot. I can't show my email at the bottom. Is there any way to fix oh, that? Oh yeah, we see it, we see it, Ellen. Oh, okay, I, okay, yep. I'm sorry. Okay, well, anyway, I'm Ellen Anders from San Jose, California. And I have had two Fulbright exchanges uh, the first one was in Canada in 1980 in history, and the second one was in uh, McNeese, Morocco, and it too was in history. And uh, so anyway, what I'm, uh, I want to do is say I would welcome anybody to contact me after you see this if you want to talk about it, or I can talk about yours as well. So I thank you all for making me feel at home here. I have had some allergies. I thought, oh my God, what will I do if I sneeze? But after watching you all, I think I'll be fine. <laughs> okay, uh, what I'm gonna start off with is talking about fashion studies and how fashion visuals and communication can work as an advocate for human rights. So um, visuals of dress can reveal a narrative of humanity that is often left out of historical accounts. 
Fashion has been devalued and not thought of as an academic discipline or worth study. Fashion images deserve a more superior placement in defining the significance of humans and their actions in order to recognize the need for more compassionate human rights. Okay, um, <clears throat> what is fashion? Many fashion writers speak of fashion as being a mirror of society, as well as being a paradigm that contains ideas for the roles people play wearing clothes. It can be viewed as a paradox in that it can be intentional or unintentional, depending on the time and context. Fashion apparel tells the inside story of who we are and becoming and revealing a personal or national identity. Here you see a picture, a portrait of Barack Obama. Fashion writer Elizabeth Wilson is quoted as saying, fashion criticism adds alternatives that may add a dimension of hope and emotional well-being in times of strife. Strife in the sense that, they, <clears throat> that during periods of great change, one needs to hang on to something that gives one the energy to move forward. How does fashion communicate that? Clothing <clears throat> images can offer an alternative to a difficult state of affairs such as when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States, raising his hand in allegiance to the country, the highest office in the land, and dressed in a typical business suit, a uniform of success. This previously unknown image of a black man in a professional business suit extended a layer of advocacy and promoted a more diverse democratic agenda to his signing in. The combination of suit and man symbolized equality and respect for the individual. Semiotics, what are semiotics? Semiotics are signals or signs that display a silhouette that can be used to shape support of a stereotypical format. Semiotic signs carry with them forms of nuance and ambiguous messages. Both wearer and viewer may have opposing definitions. Ephrat Tilson, in his book, Identities Through Fashion, summarizes, it is not enough to look at someone's wardrobe and interpret the meaning of the signals he or she is sending off with various outfits. We need to include his or her version of reality as well. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides here. Fashion Hub. What is the function of fashion? Is it for warmth? protection, cultural signifiers, markers of rank and style. Recently with the rise of the internet and visual media, the definition of fashion has become a multitude of categories so wide and so diverse that the term fashion has become a hub for an all-in-one location. It is now a mixed medley of terms such as fashion ethics, fashion gender, fashion politics, fashion wearables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is difficult to move in a fast paced manner from a regular pattern of terms into a diffused model that combines fields of studies while still in the stage of discovery. Where are viewer? Before one can anticipate a new look or disruptor, one has to be a good observer of both accepted and unaccepted social styles. The viewer may be seeing something that is not a part of an intentional statement. For example, a color symb symbolic for a specific cause can be seen by the person or viewer looking onto the wearer's clothing and form an opinion due to the viewer's knowledge of the color. Many meanings may be attracted to the color. Many, excuse me, meanings may be attached to the color. Again, the inferences swim in the opinions we form. The French Revolution in 1789, insignias were worn on men's uniform to designate rank. The tricolor, the three color cocade, blue, red, and white, were reserved to the highest ranking officers and forbidden to be worn by women. However, as the revolution continued, it became patriotic for all to wear the cocade. People were checked in at the Luxembourg Gardens to see if they were wearing the cocade. Women were expected to be respectful of the army and did so by wearing a small discreet cocade on their clothing as shown the woman 
with a small puck hat on her hat. And I don't know if you can see it, but it's up there. Okay. Appearances. After the revolution in 1810, in the Napoleonic era, the revolutionary symbols were in style. In a portrait of the woman on the left, the woman wears a large collared blouse, a defiant gesture symbol for the ancien regime. It's an open collar. <clears throat> it's a symbol of liberty. It is the color blue of her dress is the color of liberty. Her hair is disheveled in a relaxed design as compared to the previous Marie Antoinette high-piled wig style, an opposing political gesture carried on from the ancien regime. On the right, we have today Dr. Laverne Wimberly, dressed in her Sunday best. Sunday best alludes to the time when were Blacks only allowed to wear working clothing as opposed to the elegant clothes whites could wear. Later, the Black Christian Church allowed Blacks to wear elegant styles to show re uh, resistance to segregation. And Dr. Wimberly just happens to be wearing an open collar. And here we come, Don We Now, Our Gay Apparel. And this is by Sean Cole, author, and he depicts uh, gender identity. And in the pictures he's chosen, you see a pigtail. And in the 16th, 17th century, this might be an indication you were different, but you were still very discreet and you did not openly talk about it. In fact, that you could go to the guillotine for thinking that you might be homosexual. A close relationship exists between dress and gender, sexuality, age, and locality, although it is not a fixed association. It fluctuates with the time and location of the setting. Gay stereotyping for fashion has been, not been accepted by all genders, genders, age, and locality. Many gays, however, feel fashion is a sign of acceptance, fought for attainment to wear clothes that they wish to wear. And finally, we have identity, where viewer, I see you, you see me, we are alike, we are different, we are humanity, end of story, no, not yet. The challenge is searching through a millennia of artifacts and social cultural history to create a movement in which people are more informed of fairness and unfairness that can bring to the surface, be brought to the surface of human consciousness. The beauty of fashion studies is that it can be an advocate to overcome discrimination and harm to others. The act of di diplomacy, global sharing of the concept is pivotal for the change in human rights. And thank you. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, wonderful presentation. I did want to just add that um, if you could, if you want to list where you served your, um, your Fulbright, please enter it in the chat. And then during the talks after the Q&A, uh, we are going to be um, handling Q&A. And so if you have them, please enter them into the Q&A box. I would also now like to introduce Nadia, and, and also joining her is Tom Butkowitz. So Nadia and Tom. Thank you, Rob. Tom's going to share our screen. So our presentation today is um, more high level in terms of the work we have done as a chapter uh, that's existed for only two years in the Fulbright landscape. And I'll just get Tom to introduce it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Nadia. Yes, uh, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Again, it's uh, our uh, joy and pleasure to be here today, uh, taking a little bit of uh, exposure to uh, the, the works that we've done in the Walden Virtual Fulbright Board. Uh, as you can see, just on our cover slide, we've uh, spent uh, an enormous amount of time uh, working with uh, veterans and families uh, and with a wellness program. And on the right here, you see uh, a gentleman here with some children actually in Haiti, 
uh, with our, our focus uh, that lent, leaned into education, community and global partnerships, and uh, really investing in them. With, uh, with many hands, the load is not heavy. Uh, so with that, our abstract here for this session today, uh, we really focused on uh, pulling from the, the strategies and objectives and initiatives that we've uh, spent a lot of time with uh, in our leadership board uh, under the leadership uh, here of uh, uh, Dr. Nadia as our president and myself uh, as the vice president and our associate uh, board members, uh, really kind of concentrating on international pro uh, projects specific to uh, educational development, uh, wellness, and equitable access to resources that really align with what Fulbright is all about. Uh, we've conducted some bilateral initiatives between Canada and the US, uh, specific to, again, the wellness of veterans and families transitioning to civilian life, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, the Haiti uh, initiative, that was a development project that uh, I alluded to earlier, uh, really concentrated on workplace readiness and literacies that included te technology for education. And all of this, ladies and gentlemen, leans into uh, developing uh, uh, positive social change uh, with that. So uh, when we look at leveraging research, uh, experts, panel discussions, uh, we've done roundtables, uh, so many different things really kind of build into this abstract uh, that we're uh, sharing with you today. So we're really excited to be here and an opportunity to share uh, a little bit about what we're doing, uh, what we've done and what we plan on doing. So uh, the next slide here I'd like to share with you is a little bit about uh, what, where we're grounded in our chapter mission with Walden uh, Virtual Fulbright Chapter. And it's really to raise a cultural exchange awareness. And again, that aligns directly with what Fulbright's all about and providing really those opportunities within the Walden community with students, alumni, staff, and faculty. Uh, and why? Because we want them to be able to have access. That's the operative word there, ladies and gentlemen, for mentoring, professional development, service, networking, et cetera. And then also to increase uh, the number of Fulbright scholars uh, that are really have a passion for influencing positive social change further. Uh, through research, teaching, and fellowships with those uh, important cultural exchanges. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, transition now back to uh, our president, uh, Dr. Nadia, and uh, she'll talk about the different initiatives that we have. Thank you, Tom. So I think for us at a high level, the conversation is really about um, advocacy and sort of clearing the path for individuals, communities, and our partners uh, for support and development. And I'm not going to uh, rehash what Tom has shared with you, but I will say that our chapter goals really are underpinned by the UN social and economic goals. And in the two years of our existence, we've been able to develop international projects that span uh, elements of education, uh, workplace readiness, as well as uh, the development of wellness and social supports. And for us, truly, it's been an honor to be able to work in these platforms, as well as harness uh, Fulbright partnerships, whether that be through experts, scholars, and the like. And so when we look at the research around change leadership, one of the elements that we wanted to discuss is the importance of a strong board that has a vision and is able to uh, articulate that vision in action. And if you look at the UN uh, frameworks for change and equity, they really talk about the importance of uh, developing key partnerships. And for us, one of them was the Haitian American Caucus, and the other was a Florida coalition around veteran wellness. And in order for us to move change, it shifted us from that theoretical aspect of what we conceptualize as being important in the advocacy space to how are we actually going to do this. And in the end, um, what really moved our board forward was the level of high functioning ability around us in the chapter, as well as our chapter members, and the ability for us to move social change through concrete uh, development action, creating a pipeline, as well as allowing for experts in each of the fields to speak and give support based on pro bono services. So in our work in Haiti in particular, 
Uh, we did a lot, lot of work in the Haitian American Caucus with schools and education and workplace readiness. And so the Haitian American Caucus members um, really helped us understand the Haiti culture, as well as uh, the implications of change processes in Haiti. And part of that is around infrastructure, part of that is around um, that embracing of cultural differences. And another element of that is strictly logistics. That is what we seem to think for myself living in Canada and Tom in the United States as being uh, ready change processes really takes time and finesse and we have to understand the nuance of culture. And so for our elements, uh, being able to understand our scope, being agile in the space we're working in and having that cultural awareness and understanding to move the project at the pace to which individuals are comfortable with and being able to pause was integral to our success, uh, given that each of these initiatives spanned uh, only a year. We wanted to also share with you that we engaged in a series of roundtables that were high profile in nature. As you can see in this picture, and we won't belabor it per se, but we invited experts from industry, uh, from post-secondary institutions, uh, those that are bourgeoising in their research, as well as individuals that have published or are doing action research projects within the space. And in this uh, particular incidence, it was certainly related to veterans, but it was also related to the discussions of the constraints and affordances that exist within the United States and Canada around veterans transitioning to civilian life. And in Haiti, uh, we also embraced experts, whether they be scholarly experts or those individuals that work in nonprofits. Um, and there was, uh, as Tom had said, many hands that contributed to these projects. And so the other key takeaways for us as a high functioning board and chapter is uh, ensuring that we understand what change means in a developmental way. And we use the UN um, advocacy and change metrics or model for our work. And part of that looked at uh, understanding the change theoretically, understanding where the gaps are in the spaces for development, uh, keeping in mind that cultural uh, implications and aspects to change and developing it from a community source or a foundation. And part of our key success factors truly was the participation of our chapter membership. Um, we harnessed them in terms of communication, marketing, developing a pipeline, uh, bringing uh, experts to from the field to our discussions, as well as the way we moved our knowledge um, and also the reach that we had in terms of the ability to do uh, multi-level bilateral projects. So we wanted to share some references with you. And part of that is so that you understand in some ways, many of us talk about elements of the theoretical and understanding more conceptually what goes on in terms of change or the need for change, whether that be pragmatically or in terms of cultural development or education. And so for us, many of these sources helped us understand more readily how to move change in more of a developmental space. And in this way, uh, much of these sources, especially the understanding of theory of change, truly guided our ability to be so successful as a chapter existing for two years. And this year, what we are doing is uh, we're engaging more fully in the development of education as well as lifelong learning, which is goal number two under uh, the UN Economic and Social Goals. And our approach is going to be to develop a, um, an opportunity for individuals who are already researching in this area to contribute to solution finding. And we're going to embrace more of a Google iterative approach to it in order for us to provide the necessary um, voice for individuals who are finding success in this space. So if you would like any more information on what the Walden Virtual Fulbright chapter and board uh, does, please feel free to email us and we will certainly um, embrace any sort of uh, conversation, supports if you would like to participate in our initiatives, by all means.
and we'll yield to Rob. And thank you so much for um, being here for our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia and Tom. Again, if you have questions for our speakers, please enter them in the Q&A function. Um, and next we have Rocio. Okay. Um, hi, hello. It's nice to be here with all of you. Uh, so yes, I'm going to be talking about uh, the disinformation research that I have been doing here in Mexico. Uh, and this is uh, the research agenda that I have been pursuing since I came back here to Mexico from the US where I did my PhD as a Fulbright student. And I had already been interested in political deliberation, political discussion online with uh, social media. And when I came back here, it coincided with the presidential, presidential election in Mexico in 2018. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of disinformation uh, circulating. So I started focusing in a more formal way in that topic. And just so you know, uh, this research that I'm uh, gonna be talking to you about was funded by CONACYT, which is the Minister of Science here in Mexico, uh, via grants that were awarded to the political communication lab in, at the university, university where I am working. And I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is just some information that they ask us to share when we talk about this work. Um, and just to provide some uh, context uh, as to why I talk about uh, the focus on the global South, as you can imagine, there's uh, been an explosion, explosion of uh, disinformation studies, disinformation literature, but it has been mainly concentrated in the US. Um, um, as you can see here, 62% uh, of the work has been in the US and in the main uh, journals and to a lesser extent, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, but very little in South America and North America that is not the US where uh, Mexico would fit in, uh, I guess, with Canada. So this is where this work sort of uh, fits in, this work that I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, to try to address this gap, right? Um, and instead of uh, talking to you about one study in a lot of detail, I'm gonna talk about the main findings of several studies. And all of them come from, um, this data come from three surveys that were conducted uh, this year and the past year. One is a COVID-19 survey um, from September, 2020 with a, a sample representative of the, of the Mexican population. And very similarly, a survey that was conducted this year, we had midterms, midterms elections this year. Uh, and again, a representative sample of the Mexican population. And the other one is a survey for an exploratory, exploratory study that I did uh, to get the perspective of journalists, uh, journalists working here in Mexico about this phenomenon that obviously sort of impacts their work. It's a sample of uh, 127 journalists from here from Mexico. And I'm going to talk about three um, specific aspects about this information. As you uh, know, there are many, obviously, many different things to look at, but I'm going to focus on these three. One is immediate effects. And this is an issue that was talked about a lot uh, with the um, election of President Trump, right? Uh, there was a lot of discussion on whether fake news caused him to win and uh, stuff like that. As you, you know, uh, that's not something that can be established like that. Like that is not just the one factor that causes someone to vote for someone. So it's difficult to, to establish that direct relationship. But now with COVID-19, we have a, another wave of a wave of studies that have sort of started to emerge, uh, focusing on this disinformation about COVID and whether or not this affects the behavior of people in regards to the disease. The other focus are the effects on democracy. And this is a, sort of a call that has been uh, put by several scholars looking uh, beyond sort of the immediate effect, even the immediate effect of voting, 
as to look more for like how this climate of disinformation affects our attitudes toward democracy and also how this uh, situation impact uh, journalists and their ability to do their work. And the other very interesting thing that, I, uh, that has been sort of looked at recently is the motivations for sharing this information. Because as you know, a lot of people share this information because they think it's real, they believe they believe it's real, but there are some people, and this is something that has been observed and has been sort of argued by some scholars, that there are some people that do know that this disinformation is false, but they still uh, want to share it. And this has been uh, sort of named as dysfunctional attitudes and behaviors regarding disinformation. So I'm, uh, I look at this three different aspects for the case of Mexico and in regards to immediate effects uh, uh, for COVID-19 and uh, what we do what we did in this survey that I talked about we asked uh, people whether they believe or not certain uh, fake news false information about the disease and we analyzed whether this uh, affected their behavior and what I found was that in fact believing fake news about COVID-19 did lead to less compliance with these measures to avoid getting the disease. And so uh, what we're seeing here is that beyond some political uh, consequences that might, might happen, there are also these um, larger or more uh, life and death consequence that can occur as a result of this type of, of content. Uh, in regards to um, the, the effects on democracy, what I look at here was not uh, whether someone believed or not a particular fake news about uh, some false information about a political actor, but rather the perception of being exposed to this information, right? Like uh, whether in recent, in the recent years during these midterms, the, the process of the elections, whether you think that you have been exposed to this information to uh, get at uh, whether this impacts political disaffection. And what I found was that it does in fact impact, it makes people more politically disaffected in three dimensions of this concept, which are um, political cynicism, political skepticism, and political apathy. And so what we're seeing here is well this as I as I mentioned these larger consequences uh, in regard to how we perceive our democracy, right? The other related to these effects on democracy, as I mentioned, is that I was interested in the uh, perception of journalists in regards to this phenomenon, and what they what they said in this service is that they well they are of course concerned about the political views in particular of the term that is being used fake news uh, as an attack against their work. So they feel that it sort of lessens the impact that their work may have. But at the same time, I also ask them about solutions and they tend to prefer more individual solutions rather than structural solutions. So more focus on, well, let's educate the public or even let's educate journalists rather than uh, more um, bigger uh, changes or regulations or that sort of thing. And this ties in with the last thing, uh, the last aspect, which is uh, motivations for sharing this information. And what I found here um, is that even though it's not a majority, there is a group of people, uh, an important group of people that is willing to share unverified information to further a political agenda. It was about 17% around that. And these people is uh, more supportive of the president, which is of course, well, important to look at. And they were also people that are more politically engaged. So especially in uh, in-person activities of political political participation. So what we see here is this, and this is something that other scholars have talked about, a paradox of political engagement, because we usually think of this as something positive, right? Political engagement, but if you throw in uh, this information, well, the consequences might also be negative in the sense that there's more um, this information being uh, out there being shared, right? And this also, uh, calls into question um, 
some uh, some of the solutions that have been proposed about this information, like media literacy, because these people um, they did have skills to recognize. Uh, this is something that I also looked at, and they did have skills to recognize fake news or uh, disinformation, but they didn't care. They still thought that it was worthy to share this disinformation. So that's something uh, that I'm interested in. They want to uh, keep uh, looking at. And this last thing, uh, sort of two variables that color these aspects is that we have a much younger democracy here in Mexico. Uh, so we have weaker institutions. We have a democracy of less than three decades. And the other is that we have a more constrained journalism in the sense of a in sense of a crisis of economic crisis, credibility crisis, but also more unsafe conditions to work. And so this only makes more vulnerable and harder to sort of combat this, this issue. Uh, and um, so this is uh, it for now. And I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you very much. That was a a very timely presentation in a number of ways, isn't it? So thank you. Yes. Lisa, we'd like to introduce now Lisa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me, Rob, and everyone um, to this panel. Um, today, um, well, first I'll say that um, I was a Fulbright scholar uh, right before the pandemic, the year before the pandemic started um, in um, Ontario, Canada, um, and I was working on a uh, documentary film there called Safe Haven, um, which has not yet been released due to the pandemic because I collaborated with a Canadian on the project and um, because um, we need to go back and forth um, between the two countries. We haven't yet um, distributed the film. Um, that will be for a future presentation, but today I'm here to talk about my film, um, which is currently out, which is called Missing in Brooks County. And um, I think we'll start by watching um, the 90 second trailer and then I can talk to you um, more about the film. Hey Lisa, I can't, I can't hear the sound on it. Oh, okay, hold on. Can, can you Let me reshare. Um, just check those two boxes at the yeah, bottom and it should work. Got it, thank you. The federal government thinks if you put the border patrol station 60 miles north, Jose is going to be stupid enough to go through there and then you'll catch him. And that's not true. The Border Patrol Station is making these people walk in that deep sand with very little water. I'm trying to have some information regarding a family member who is missing. We realized there was a big problem along the border. And I don't think anybody realized just how big it was. Thousands of people have died. An illegal alien crosser is an illegal alien crosser. It's black and white, it's not gray. We're in a war zone here. This is the South Texas Human Rights Center. It's like you just walk off the earth. It's as if you never existed.
Okay, so um, so that um, film is um, out right now. It's going to be streaming on all the usual platforms. So if you're interested in seeing it, um, you can find it um, starting in November. Um, but I want to talk today about um, the issue, um, the main issue in the film and talk to you a little bit about the making of the film and what we've been doing with the film um, since um, since we began this uh, journey of making this film. So the main um, focus of the film is a policy um, that started um, during the Clinton administration in the early 90s called Prevention Through Deterrence. And this policy is um, at the heart of our film. And um, the film is about Brooks County, Texas, um, which is 70 miles north of the border. So it's not on the border. It's not on the US-Mexico border. It is um, 70 miles north where there's an interior checkpoint. And due to this interior checkpoint, when migrants um, are brought um, with their smuggling group up, um, to, you know, they, they cross the border, they're um, driven up to Brooks County, and they get out of the car and they circumvent the checkpoint, as you saw in the trailer. And this is where people are going missing and dying. So um, this policy has, again, been around since the early 90s. And the idea behind the policy was that it would prevent people, migrants, from um, coming into the country. Um, and unfortunately, the circumstances for the migrants coming um, have not changed and they've only um, gotten worse. And so this um, situation um, continues and people um, continue to come and um, have to cross in dangerous areas. So um, before this um, policy, um, migrants were um, able to um, come in safer parts of the um, of the border and so they weren't um, going into really remote areas without without water um, in the summer and in, in very very hot temperatures so um, this is what's going on there and um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got um, I, I, how I learned about this um, so um, my, the co-director Jeff Bemis and I um, had heard about the work of a forensic scientist um, who is um, exhuming remains of um, unknown migrants who have died in Brooks County. And we were interested in her work. And so we met her and she brought us down to Brooks County. I had never heard of Brooks County. And this was in January, 2015. Um, and when we got there, we were introduced to the sheriff and um, Eddie Canales, who is the um, human rights worker, who is sort of the um, a main um, person featured in our film. And we met ranch owners and, and other people in the town. And we realized that this was a much bigger story than we had initially thought. Um, and we, um, over the course of four years, we kept going back to Brooks County every few months for about two weeks um, and eventually found the Romans, who are the main family um, in our film, whose um, story of their son and, and their brother um, who went missing in Brooks County. And they go back to Brooks County to try and um, find out what happened to him. So um, that's um, how we got into it. And um, the film is now... Um, has been um, released. It will be on um, PBS, um, the series Independent Lens in January. Um, but since we finished the film, um, we've been working with um, immigration advocates um, across the country, um, trying to get the film in front of um, people, elected officials who can actually make some change. Um, Again, this is not a new policy. This has been going on for decades. Um, it's particularly bad um, this summer for a few reasons. Um, one, because um, all of the militarization that was put into place around the checkpoint during the Trump administration is still in place. Um, but also, um, obviously, since the Biden administration, more migrants are coming into our country through the southern border. Um, and also because of climate change. Um, Southern Texas is a very hot part of the country and migrants tend to come during the hotter months 
because of the hunting season, um, which is October through March. And so migrants tend to come in the hotter months because of that. Um, and all of these factors together are creating a situation where the remains that have been found um, this year are three times as many as were found in 2020. So the situation is serious and it's not going away. And um, we hope that we can get the film in front of people who um, can't ignore the stories of the families, obviously. Um, but also the other thing our film brings up is something we think is really important, which is the death count. Um, so Border Patrol puts out reports every year of the number of remains that they find um, in, in, in any given um, part of the border. And so um, their um, numbers are very low compared to um, what others are finding. And there are a few reasons for that. One is Border Patrol only puts out the numbers when they are present at a recovery and Border Patrol is not present at, at every recovery. Um, they are present at some recoveries, but for example, like in Brooks County, usually remains are found by hunters who are just going out hunting um, and, and end up in a remote part of some ranch. Um, so that's one reason. Um, the other uh, reason uh, we know that the numbers are very low is I live in Tucson. Um, there's a the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office here in Tucson. Um, which also receives remains um, of migrants who, who die in the Sonoran Desert. And the number of remains found at the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office and the number that Border Patrol is reporting in any given year is um, very different. Um, and then the third reason is our film. So um, the numbers don't take into account the people that are missing. And the people um, working on this crisis in Brooks County, um, getting calls from families who are missing, um, they're, they're looking for a missing loved one. They, um, they um, say that one in five um, remains or bodies are found. Um, so if you think about that, um, this is what the sheriff of Brooks County has stated, or Eddie Canales, who works at the South Texas Human Rights Center, who gets calls from families. Um, we're only, Border Patrol is only reporting one fifth of, you know, what, um, you know, of the people who are missing. Um, so in our film, we, we give the number of 20,000 people have died um, crossing the border since the early 90s. Um, we've been told by advocates that that number is very, very low. Um, we did, didn't feel comfortable putting in a number that was bigger than we really could prove. Um, Ford Virtual has stated about 8,300. Um, we are stating 20,000. There are some people like the, um, the group, um, the Arizona-based group, No More Deaths, um, puts out the number 80,000. So um, we um, feel like if people understood the numbers we're talking about here, they would be quite alarmed. And so we hope that the film can um, bring awareness um, both to the public, um, the voters of this country, but also elected officials. So thank you so much for letting me share um, this film with you today. Um, and I hope you look forward. It's called Missing in Brooks County. And I'll put the website of the film in the chat so you can learn more about what we're doing with the film and where you can find the film. Thank you very much, Lisa. That's very moving. <clears throat> and finally, we have Margaret. Margaret, uh, you're up. Thank you, Dr. Lively, for hosting us and getting us through our, our session. I will uh, tie my presentation on Fulbright's legacy at the University of Arkansas, caught in the culture wars, to my Fulbright experience. I was in Panama not long after the US invasion and of course the downfall of the military regime and the resumption after decades of civilian government. And so part of institutionalizing civilian uh, political culture 
was a disestablishment of institutions and a renaming of places, especially places in the public square. Little did I imagine that some decades later, I would be looking at a very different public square uh, and as a Fulbrighter in particular, to look at uh, controversy over Fulbright's statue and the name of the Fulbright's college was uh, an unanticipated event. And so on my poster, you can see the Fulbright statue. It's right behind Old Main. And then you also see the mission statement of the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences. And most of the mission statement is quite typical of colleges and universities until you get to the last three words, fostering peace through education forward, fostering peace through education. And I'll tell you in advance that the Fulbright statue does still stand at the University of Arkansas and his name still brands the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, but removal was a near miss. The campus was poised to relocate the statue to an inside venue where it could be contextualized and the senator's record of opposing civil rights could be balanced with uh, the foreign policy record with which we are so familiar. And the controversy uh, came at a time when the University of Arkansas had already begun a diversity initiative back in 2013. It wasn't until after the death of George Floyd that the Fulbright statue prompted protests. There were, as on many college campuses, postings on a black at, black at UARC, hashtag, and that sparked anti-racist rallies on campus and over 5,000 students and others signed an anti-Fulbright petition demanding removal of his statue and the renaming of the college. On the other side of the poster, you can see uh, a photo of a demonstration. These were not large. Uh, you can see what the students wrote on their signs and you can see uh, as I do my discourse analysis of what was the conversation, what were people saying pro and con about Fulbright, change.org uh, was the platform for an anti-Fulbright uh, petition. Over 5,000 persons signed the petition, and about 100 of those actually put their own reasons. And so these quotes are from the language of the reasons that uh, the students and others shared. The conflict mediation process on campus was both, it was very Fulbright. It was both educational and conciliatory. Chancellor Steinmetz and black student leaders hosted together uh, town halls, small meetings, large meetings. Uh, the educational component of course came from the history department and others. Uh, and particularly from Dr. Randall Woods. We all know Randall is one of the foremost biographers of, of Fulbright. And this, th the discussions focused both on the senator's achievements, but also the shortcomings and the general question of how bad is too bad? How do we weigh in a judgment way how bad the civil rights record is compared to the worth on the other side of uh, the work of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, the anti-Vietnam hearings, the Fulbright Program International Exchange. On the campus, a representative committee uh, was created by the chancellor with representation from students, faculty, stakeholders, uh, and it took them more than nine months to complete a study of the situation and to recommend what to do with the statue and changing the name. They ended up with a very strong recommendation in favor of relocating the statue and changing the name of the college. Everyone up in the campus community agreed that Fulbright's legacy is complex and mixed, and Fulbright a person, so complex. The question for the campus was whether opposing the 64 Civil Rights Act and subsequent legislation, and, and particularly signing the Southern Manifesto, were sufficiently egregious to ban the statue and Fulbright's name. As this was going on on campus, down in the state capitol in Little Rock, 
not initially focused on the Fulbright statue itself, but Senator Clark was approached by one of the county historical societies concerned by the general movement in the South where Confederate statues um, are being uh, torn down, relocated. Uh, and so the concern was whether or not Arkansas needed a law to protect markers, man monuments, statues, and other historical uh, markers. And so the bill was passed. Um, one was introduced a couple years earlier, but by 2020, legislation was passed. And it provided that historical monuments shall not be moved. And were someone to move a monument, a sizable fine would be imposed. And then, as is normal for the state legislature to engage in oversight over the university, uh, the president of the university system, President Bobbitt and Chancellor Steinmetz, uh, were invited down to explain the goings on at the university campus. And just as the discourse among the students was about what the statue meant to them, and whether the Fayetteville community, the college community could endure and go forward with the statue. The, the discourse down in the Capitol was very much about the power of the state legislature and this Monuments Act and a call for um, almost a wake up call from the perspective of the legislators that uh, the campus was heading in the wrong direction. For example, some were concerned that uh, American history and heritage was being canceled, canceled culture uh, made manifest. Some concerned that um, there was a, a disproportionality between the respect for the past and the students' pain in the present. Uh, Chancellor Steinmetz was so uh, concerned to hear what the students are saying and hear the discourse in the minority community and the majority is so different. And so many were so surprised by the kinds of things that were mentioned on the Black at UARC. And so there was a disjuncture between how the senators saw the protesters, one even referred to them as snowflakes, um, and so the, um, the senators insisted that, of course, the law prevailed and the campus leaders agreed that, of course, the law prevailed. There is a possibility that the Board of Trustees could change the name of the Fulbright College because that's a, not a monument. Uh, but as the situation stands now, the students have moved on to other diversity and inclusion issues and protests continue to uh, change the campus culture. Uh, the legislature is vi vi vigilant and we, it's just yet to be seen um, whether or not uh, the statute controversy will come up again. And so... Uh, it was interesting to me to find that my presentation was so in line with identity in terms of fashion and social change and, and theories of change and dealing with social justice uh, and what happens to minorities. Uh, so I appreciate your attention. Look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, a very moving presentation. And, and if folks can rejoin us here, um, coming back onto the screen. Good, thank you. And thank you to all of you. Munir, the questions have kind of disappeared from my Q&A. Yes, some of them have been uh, typed answers from the panelists themselves. So. If you click on the answered tab, you might be able to see some near the bottom that were already answered. Um, and you could uh, repeat those questions maybe for the panel, if that makes sense. Right, yes, yes. There was, there was one for Ellen that has disappeared. I don't know, uh, one for Ellen, did you say? Y yes, and... Um, I answered it on the um, Q&A, whatever it was, I did answer it, put it in. 
I think it was about could uh, fashion um, articles be neut uh, culturally neutral? And I replied that not unless it was, you know, the time, it depend on the time, place, context, and also it would take an educated community to know about the visuals and how they could be interpreted. So I think that it's possible, but I, I think it's in the process of going to, to become something soon. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. There was a question for Nadia and Tom. Did you folks answer that separately? Yes, we did. And so the question, one of the questions was, uh, does the UN Development Goals synchronize with Haitian economic reality? And a great question. And so we answered talking about um, the implications of Haitians aspirationally wanting the support and development, but from developing from within and the ability to work with the Haitian American Caucus to some degree realize that at the same time, understanding that the nature in Haiti is riddled with constraints and, uh, but they still stand strong and, and want the supports to develop. Mm -hmm. Very good. And are there questions for Rocio? Did, did you answer any questions, Rocio? No, I didn't see any question. Yeah, I, I don't see any either. That's such a, such a hot topic <laughs> on your side of the border as well as on this side of the border. What? What can be done about that? What, um, what are you doing about it? What can we do about it? Yeah, that's a very, <laughs> like the million dollar question, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's all about um, the lack of trust in institutions uh, and uh, not only political institutions, but also the media. So I think, um, because I, I mentioned how some um, solutions such as media literacy might be insufficient because the reality is that the people don't trust the media. So they don't have any incentives to uh, believe the media more than this random uh, disinformation, fake news that they are finding elsewhere, right? So it is a matter of, um, I think a lot for um, media institutions to take a look at why people are not trusting them, uh, on, also politicians, but if you are talking that we tend to have this perception that journalists should have this, um, trust from the public because that's sort of their normative responsibility but they don't and so I think uh, yeah it is a matter of uh, not sort of patronizing the people or co being condescending to the people but actually looking into why why people don't believe you you are not reflecting their problems and so they don't have any incentive to trust you mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, thank you. I saw that there was a question for Lisa. Has that, let's see if that has appeared. Yes, I was over eager and I answered it. Um, oh, okay. So it seems that someone in the audience um, is also in Tucson. So they were curious to know um, whether I was planning on um, making a film about the uh, migrant death crisis here in Southern Arizona. And one of the reasons why we chose Texas is because Texas has really become the epicenter for migrant deaths um, in recent years. Um, but also, I, I didn't go into this in my presentation, but the other reason is because the, um, the situation in Texas is different in some ways than it is here in Arizona, where we have a centralized um, system to deal with this crisis. In Texas, there is no centralized system. Uh, Texas is made up of many, many ca uh, ca different counties, which are all doing their own thing. Um, and there's no real protocol to deal with migrant deaths. And so we go into some of this dysfunction um, 
of the crisis in Texas, which we found, which we thought was really important. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to say to that lovely person who asked the question um, was that the um, the films that I've tended to focus on here um, in Arizona um, are more um, also um, another film about deterrence, about um, a woman seeking asylum who ends up at a detention center um, here in Eloy, Arizona, which uh, detention centers are another form of deterrence, as is the wall and other kinds of law enforcement, um, the, the checkpoints, of course, um, which we go into in Missing Brooks County, but um, the detention centers are definitely um, there to deter uh, asylum seekers. Um, but unfortunately, the reasons for leaving their home countries are strong enough for them to leave. Um, and so detention center or no detention center, they will be coming. Um, and so I made a film called Soledad about a very, very brave um, asylum seeker who shares her story in her process of going to Eloy and, and um, trying to seek asylum in this country. So thank you for the question, fellow Tucsonan. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Let's see. A, a question for Margaret. Have you personally ever been the recipient of hate speech or threats due to your association with the Fulbright Association? while you are being a professor at the University of Arkansas? No, I have not. Um, the, uh, now it may be because there's not a distinctive hat or uniform mm -hmm. that would allow people to identify me uh, in that capacity. Um, I thought as I was hearing the question that I would hear, you know, in Panama, because, you know, U.S. person and, you know, the whole overwhelming U.S. presence. But, but no, no. Um, and I'm thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, maybe I've lived in a bubble whenever it comes to Fulbright. Um, I always just had him up on that pedestal. But there, as you, as you said, there, there are various layers and dimensions, aren't there? That there are. Um, and it's not widely known that he did, vo he did vote for the 1970 civil rights legislation. By that time, he felt that his own personal political risk had gone sufficiently down. Uh, but we could say the same thing about Robert Byrd um, and, and several others. There's a, if you just go across the map, there's a tier of senior senators uh, who all stood for uh, the Southern Manifesto. Uh, and it's one of those, you know, how history is. We don't get do-overs. Uh, but if we did, wouldn't it be interesting if the same approach to, if we just got to know each other, you know, if we had more local exchange, you know, overcoming, you know, segregation, if only, what would have happened? We won't know. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Very, very good point. Rosia, a question has come in. Are there sources of information other than the media that can reach people in Mexico and combat disinformation, like teachers, community leaders, churches, etc.? And that's yeah. the um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's been the advantage of uh, this new media, new technology, social media, etc. So, yes, but also there's, I mean, that's where also this information proliferates. So, um, that's sort of the negative side of that. But yeah, surely, and um it has been very significant to have as as elsewhere right but in particular in mexico that we had media that was were very associated with um this political system because we didn't have a democracy for many years and that sort of lasted for longer and it still it still happens uh, yeah, it, it has been been helpful, and there are some 
in some instances as, as uh, here as, as you have in the US, but um, also the dark side of the disinformation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, thank you. Munir, do you see any other questions? Um, there are a couple in the open questions. Um, but Rob, if you have any other, if you have questions or if other panelists have questions for each other, you know, we can also uh, field those. Right, yes, yes. Um, so do you folks have questions for each other? I think that one of the things that, that we're seeing is, is the role of social media. And I think had it not been, for example, the hashtag uh, that allowed an anonymous way for so many students to, to share their experiences, that uh, the consider on, consideration on campus wouldn't have been as, as brutal in terms of the recognition that what's been happening and I would think social media for sure in terms of uh, both uh, recording incidents on the, you know, in the borderlands uh, is it makes a very different environment uh, for I mean, border crossings 30 years ago and, and boarding, border, border crossings in the era of social media. It's a, it can be an awful thing putting, you know, traffickers in, in touch with, with people who need to move and enforcement surveillance, but social media has really changed the reality that we're observing. Same thing for disinformation. Well, can it spread? Yes. Thank you, a very good point. Yes, the, a question has come in for Rocio and Lisa. It seems like there is an intersection with your projects. Lisa, do you think media disinformation that gets in the way of finding meaningful solutions to the immigration issues that are the basis for your, for your film? Well, yeah, I mean, disinformation and lack of education, those two things uh, about um, why people are migrating to this country um, but also, you know, one thing that's a, a really good point that they're making there, the, the overlap between our talks, um, you know, for me, um, one of the things that comes up a lot is, well, why don't, why don't migrants come legally? So we're, the, my film is about people that come undocumented, um, you know, not, not claiming asylum, but, you know, coming undocumented through through um, Texas. And the, the very simple answer to why people um, are not coming legally is um, that the wait is like 20 years. And when you're fleeing gang violence and corruption, you're not gonna wait 20 years. It's very, very simple. And it's just very interesting. And I think it's because of social media and this very, sh these short, you know, things that people put out, their opinions about this topic that, that spread that are just so based in a lack of knowledge about how the system works and you know, how um, immigration works in our country. Good, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panelists. I think it's been an excellent conversation. Some really important issues have been raised and I think that we as Fulbrighters always need to ask ourselves, how can we help? What can we do in terms of, of, of helping to, to find solutions, to find ways forward? And so thank you very much to all of you and thanks to our viewers. Um, and we have another presentation coming up at five o'clock. So thank you once again.